Easter Dreamers, welcome to a very special video because I'm celebrating my 40th Yay! birthday. How did it get to this? I was celebrating my 36th birthday on YouTube with you guys just last week, right? And now 40 years. So to mark this special occasion, I went on YouTube and Instagram and asked you guys to ask me 40 questions. 40 questions for a 40 year old. And you guys did a fantastic job. I'm gonna answer all those questions as quickly and honestly as possible. But first, I'd just like to warn you that somewhere in the middle of this video, there is an amazing special offer that I'm giving you guys. So make sure you're around to find out what it is. Thank you to all of you for sending questions. All right, let's get to question number one. Okay, Claudia on YouTube asked, if you had to pick another country to live in, which one would you choose? I think at this point in my life, I would choose Singapore. I've lived in Spain, Argentina, and Hong Kong, and I feel like I've got one more trip in me, and I think Singapore would be the place. I've been there before. Uh, I had a great trip there a few years ago. The food is just incredible, and I love the location, the fact that you can get to so many amazing countries um, so easily. So I think, yeah, I'll go with Singapore. Okay, I don't know how to say this Instagram handle, but thank you for your question. Uh, what plans do I have for the future? Well, the immediate future, I wanna celebrate my birthday with my girlfriend and with my family. Then, me and Shana are off to Singapore, funnily enough. We're going for two weeks to Singapore, the Philippines, and Hong Kong as a sort of celebratory trip. That's gonna be amazing. In the longer term, for Eat, Sleep, Dream English, I'm gonna release a business English book that's coming really soon. Then I'm gonna release another course and the big thing is that I want to release a podcast all about British life, British culture, some language, some TV, some film, some music, things going on in London. Um, yeah, that's something I really want to do. Anano on YouTube asks me, um, what's your favorite thing you've experienced while making this channel? What a great question that is. Um, I think two things. I think firstly, sort of finding the confidence in myself to put myself out there uh, on social media, um, in the public eye, to be seen by millions of people around the world. Uh, it's been hard, um, especially when I'm editing and I'm listening to my own voice. And you know, to begin with, I didn't like hearing my own voice and now I'm just used to it, it's what it is. But yeah, that was probably something that I had to deal with and just having the confidence to put a video out on YouTube or Instagram and see what comments you get back or what feedback you get. So that's been uh, an interesting journey. I think though, the part that's been the most rewarding is meeting you guys. So I'm so lucky to get lots of comments on YouTube and Instagram uh, from you guys and that's fantastic. And then when I've done my meetups in person and I get to see you guys and I get to put faces to names, it's amazing. I've done a few uh, meetups in London, Hong Kong. Uh, I did one in uh, South Korea with uh, Ali from Papa Teach Me, and that was amazing. Shaking hands, um, sharing drinks, um, conversations, finding out your stories. That was amazing. So I think that has been the, the best part of this journey. Okay, back on Instagram, uh, Jamie Antonio Mendez asks, what are your tips for learning English? The way that I approach learning is small and often. So I teach my students to learn in bite-sized chunks. I think finding consistency in your learning is more important than studying for long stretches of time. I think little and often is the best way. Many of you will know one of my favorite books is Atomic Habits by James Clear, and it's all about fostering positive learning habits. And I think that applies to learning English perfectly. I think studying 10 minutes or 15 minutes every day is so much better than one day a week for two hours because I think if you build that consistency over time, it's compounding, right? You're compounding your knowledge over time. Whereas if you study once a week, by the time you study again, you might have forgotten what you've learned. So little and often is my approach to learning. JJKS asks, could you please give some advice for non-English speakers who have to deliver lectures in English. Well, I think this advice I would give to native speakers, non-native speakers, whoever, and that is to write out your lecture or your speech, and then to take the first sentence and just to break it up into chunks, 
Okay, so two or three, four chunks. Um, and write it out. So the first three words, then the space, then the next couple of words, space, etc. Obviously making sure it's logical where you leave that space. And that gap between the words should be where you naturally breathe and it should give you the opportunity to uh, put some space into your words. Because when we're speaking in public, I certainly am very nervous and I may speak quite quickly. I might mumble or swallow my words. So this is a really nice way to make sure that you breathe space into your speech. I did that with my best man speech and a eulogy that I had to do. And it really helped when I was reading the speech, it really helped me to go at a good pace, to breathe, to speak clearly and more coherently. Okay, and a great question here. Uh, when hearing non-native English speakers attempting uh, to speak English with a British accent, what would the Brits feel about it and what do they think? That's a really good question. I think generally speaking, your accent isn't too important. I think people just want you to be able to communicate clearly, right? So if you have a Italian accent or if you have a Japanese accent and you're speaking English, that's great, no problem. I think people don't mind whether it's Italian or Japanese or if you've got a Cockney accent or I don't think people mind too much. I don't think it's a problem. Um, so I would say be authentic to your accent, wherever you're from. Uh, but if you've picked up a bit of a British accent in some way, then great. I, th I think it can be quite endearing, um, but I don't think it's the most important thing. I think being clear and uh, communicating confidently, I think that's probably better. Gold underscore car asked me, what is your absolute favorite spot in London? <sighs> what a question. Where do I even begin? Okay, one particular place. If you do come to London, I would say go to Primrose Hill. It's a hill in North London, uh, just north of uh, Regent's Park and you climb up to the top of the hill, take a picnic or maybe a bottle of wine, take a loved one, someone special, uh, just go sit there. Particularly on a summer's afternoon, just sit there and just watch the world go by. Um, you have this incredible view of London, you can see everything. Uh, the east of London, Canary Wharf, you can see the city, you can see the West End, you can see the London Eye, St Paul's Cathedral, everything. And it's a beautiful place to be. Yagit Jalan asks, uh, I want to know about your educational background. So generally speaking, I've always been a humanities kind of person. I was always quite good at English at school, history, geography, things like that. Terrible at maths, terrible at science, which is a real shame because I find them fascinating. Just I'm not good at them. Um, and then at university, I studied media and popular culture, which was an interesting choice. But it led me to a job at the BBC. So I guess there was some logical sense there. And then from um, TV, I worked in TV for a bit, and then I moved into teaching because of my mum and uh, other influences on me. So yeah, that's how I got here. Patrice Bear asks, you're turning 40 next month. Uh, oh, you're turning 40 next month, congratulations. Do you still feel 30 like me? Yeah, to an extent, but 30 to 40, yeah, I feel a little bit more uh, at ease with myself, who I am. Um, I definitely noticed that I can't, physically do the things that I used to do. I can't run as fast, I can't lift as heavy. But yeah, I think you always feel younger than you are, right? I think that's a, a natural thing. Guys, I have a very, very special offer for you. Because it's my 40th birthday, I am offering 40% off my courses and books. That's right, 40% off. Now, this flash sale only lasts for 48 hours. You can click the link in the description below right now and use the code TEACHERTOM40 to get your huge discount. Guys, there are resources there to help you improve your English. Take it to the next level. I have my pronunciation course, I have my 30 days to better English, and I have my book, A Really British Guide to English. This sale will never happen again. I'm never gonna make it as big as this until my 50th birthday in 10 years time when I'll give you half price. <laughs> All right, guys. The link is in the description below. Remember the offer code, TEACHERTOM40. Okay, uh, them see myth, I don't know how you say that. Advice for 20 something, what should I do when I have no idea what I want to do? Wow, that's a great question. And you know, I'll be honest, I don't think I feel qualified to give you advice or anyone advice. Something I've been thinking about recently is 
the quote, I can't remember where it came from, where it's like, you are the things that you consume. So you are the news that you listen to, you are the podcasts you listen to, the people you surround yourself with. And I think to an extent we can control that. So when I think about, for example, podcasts, I think about um, trying to find podcasts that enrich me, that leave me feeling smarter, or I understand the world a bit differently. There's an author called Tim Ferriss who says that you are the average of the five people you associate with most. So that could be friends, family, uh, etc. It could be people that you choose to bring into your life. So podcasts, wise, smart people uh, on podcasts or authors or wherever it might be. And through their voices, through their wisdom, their intelligence, you can kind of raise yourself up. And through all that, I think you'll start to find out what you want to do. I think when you start to consume the right things, you start to foster different ideas and you start to think differently and new opportunities arise. So I don't have a piece of advice to say you should do this or do that, but just start thinking about what you consume. And I think through absorbing all that, you'll start to um, find some answers to your questions. Stefano Melisis asks, have I ever been to Greece? Yes, I've been to Greece several times as a kid. I've been to Kefalonia, Corfu, the food obviously fantastic. Yeah, I love Greece, would love to go back. Yaroslava asks, uh, why is fish and chips so popular in the UK? Two reasons, tradition and it's delicious. Okay, La Ibaranata asks uh, if I'm learning any other languages. Well, currently, not at this exact moment, but a couple of months ago, I had started learning Hindi so that I could speak to my girlfriend's mum and dad. I haven't taken any lessons recently, but I'm gonna pick it up again, absolutely. Um, I still got a little bit of knowledge from what I learnt. Abkesi um, here was a phrase that I remember learning, um, but yes, I need to continue. I need to continue doing that now. On Instagram, I am Daria Wolf asks, are you in a happy place in your life right now? <laughs> What a question, I love that. Yeah, um, I am pretty happy right now, I have to say, yeah. Um, I'm really, I'm just, I have so much to be thankful for, so much to be grateful for. Um, I start every day with a little gratitude diary, um, and I think of three things that I'm grateful for in my life, and I always have loads of things to write, um, whether it's you know the people in my life, the love that I have, um, the job that I have, all these kinds of things, the health of my body and my family and all those kinds of things. So yeah, I would say I am uh, really happy in life. I think uh, there's things I would change, of course, um, and particularly with Eat, Sleep, Dream English, there are things I want to do uh, to make it grow and expand. Um, so there's always that sort of push and drive, but essentially, yeah, pretty happy. <laughs> Ola Kurbiel asks about um, university and if Brexit has changed anything for university. I don't know how Brexit has impacted university for um, overseas students. Um, you ask whether I don't have any uni recommendations. I mean, you know, it all depends on what you're studying, what kind of person are you, what do you want from university. One broad tip that I would give is that there are loads of great university cities and towns um, all around Britain that are a really lovely size. I chose not to study in London because I'm from London and I kind of wanted to get out of London. And I understand why people do choose to study in London. It's got some amazing universities. But I also think that cities like Bristol, Leeds, Edinburgh, Manchester, um, you know, Newcastle, they are really wonderfully sized. They're kind of big so they've got lots of things going on events music that kind of thing but also quite small so you can you're never far away from your friends from events from all the things that are going on and i quite like that size so i would say do your research and think about the location as much as the university okay dana doc garcia seven asks what's the thing that makes you happiest in the world wow i mean where do i even begin with that um, Tottenham Hotspur winning a football match makes me pretty happy. Um, getting hugs from uh, my loved ones, from my girlfriend, from my niece and nephew, uh, from uh, my sister's dog, Sky, that makes me pretty happy. Okay, but maybe this is a strange answer, but the feeling I get 
after surfing. So I'll go out surfing, I'll be out in nature, it's tiring, it's exciting, it's a bit scary. And then I come in and um, I'll have maybe like some food and um, a drink uh, on the beach and I'll look back out of the waves. And just that feeling of appreciation and that feeling of exhaustion that I love. Yeah, that makes me pretty happy, I have to say. Okay, Treasy DCM wanted to see some pictures of me when I lived in Spain, uh, in San Sebastian. I lived there in 20, no, 2008 or nine, something like that, around then, many, many years ago. Um, and I had longer hair and I looked a lot younger. Here's a few photos. Marcelo Estevez asks, what have you got from life over 40 years old? Tell, uh, tell about your nice and bad experiences. Wow, okay, um, I've, my mind immediately goes to, I guess it's a bad experience. Okay, so, so I lost my mother uh, about five years ago, um, which was obviously devastatingly hard, right, to lose someone that you love so much. So that was a tough time and we went through a lot of hardship as a family, as all families do. My mum was suffering from cancer, so it was a year and a half of treatment and all that kind of stuff. So obviously that's a hard experience um, and that, you know, I, we learnt to kind of deal with uh, the new normal of each moment. So we go to the doctor and they would say, okay, your mum can't eat now because she has a problem with her stomach. So that became the new normal. So, okay, she can't eat. So we'll, we have to find an alternative way for her to, to get nutrition. So each time we went into the doctor, we had new information and so we had to change. Um, the moment that I remember really clearly was I had to shave her hair because she had got, because she went through chemotherapy. And so it was like, okay, this is the new normal. Mum doesn't have any hair. How can we adapt to that? So we got her some head scarves and, you know, got used to it. She actually looked great with uh, no hair. She sort of made it work for herself. So I guess that was a real lesson from a tough time. Uh, and then at the end, the last moment, this is actually, um, it's really tough. So um, saying goodbye to her, um, we had a couple of hours just to sit there by her bedside. And um, all we talked about was the happy times that we shared with her. So the holidays, um, the special memories that we had. We didn't talk about anything else, you know. It's a bit of a cliche, we talk about cars or houses or jewellery or anything silly like that, we talked about memories. Um, and that really sort of helped to reaffirm that in me, that the most important things in life are making memories with the people that you love. So that was a really amazing lesson to learn from, yeah, a particularly hard moment. But yeah, that's what I've learned. Okay, Sparsha R asks, um, I just want to know, how do you change between multiple accents and still sound like a natural? To be honest, I don't think I do. My accents, they're not that good. What I would say is I use like little um, gateway words to help me into an accent. And there's a comedian called Jimmy Carr who talks about this, how he uses the word Kawasaki to help him speak in a Geordie accent. So he goes, Kawasaki, Kawasaki, and then he can start speaking Geordie because it kind of helps. Um, so with like a Cockney accent, I'll be like, all right, gorgeous, all right, gorgeous. Just saying that phrase helps me go into a Cockney accent. With Scouse, it might be like, uh, eh, eh, wah, wah. I'll just say the word what, but in a Scouse way, and that helps me to get into a Scouse accent. So yeah, that's how I try to do it. Uh, I'm Daria Wolf asks, what advice would you give to non-native ESL teachers who make mistakes in English? I would say to all uh, teachers, but particularly non-native speakers, um, own your mistake, right? Don't try and hide it. Don't try and pretend it didn't happen. Own it. Just say, yeah, I made that mistake. The first lesson I ever gave as a fully qualified English teacher, I thought I was teaching the present perfect. I was actually teaching the past perfect. And my wonderful students just, just believed me for about 40 minutes. And then one of them said, uh, teacher Tom, um, uh, are you sure that's right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, it's right. Yeah, absolutely. And then they were like, I don't think it's right. And I had a look at it and I was like, oh no, I've been teaching the total wrong thing. And I owned it and I just went like, guys, I'm so sorry. I, yeah, I effed up here. <sighs> let's, let's figure this out. So 
I think you just got to be honest and just know that it's not you're not making a mistake because you're a non-native English speaker. We all make mistakes, especially as teachers. You're going to make mistakes. It's a part of it. Just own it. Be honest. I think your your students will respond really well to you just being honest. And then just make sure next time you've learned from your mistakes, you show them how professional you are, you show them how good a teacher you are, and you'll be fine. Edie asks, um, I'd like to know if you are single or married. I'm not married. I am in a relationship. Um, yeah, we've been together for three years. Edie also asks, have you been to Brazil? No, I've never been to Brazil. I would love to go. I lived in Argentina and was so close. Vel 13 Etnia, I don't know how you say that. How, do you, how did you start as an English teacher? Um, so I was working for the BBC. I was really bored with my job. I didn't, it just didn't fulfill me. My mum was an English teacher. And so it made the logical sense to take the course and to see if I liked it. And I wanted to travel around the world. So I did the CELTA course at St. Giles Highgate, uh, qualified, um, and then traveled the world to Spain, Argentina, Hong Kong, and etc. And British English learner asks, what pieces of pronunciation advice would you give Iranians who speak English? Oh, this is advice for all speakers of English, not just Iranian speakers. Um, if you are not at the beginner stage, you're kind of intermediate, I would start focusing on connected speech and how we blend sounds and words together. Um, I have a course, a pronunciation course that looks into all of that. You can check out at my shop, uh, shop.eatsleedreamenglish.com. Um, I think connected speech is the most important way to improve your pronunciation and to start speaking more fluently because this is how we blend sounds and words together. And there are lots of little techniques that we use that you can learn. So I would say whether you're Iranian speaker or uh, Italian or whatever, that's where I'd focus my attention. Vinmu03 asks, how's your lovely sister? And when are you gonna make another video? So my sister is great, she's fantastic. Um, so she was in a couple of my videos a few years ago. We went for some walks and talks and um, they were very popular. It was really natural conversations. Um, and yeah, I should totally do one again. I'll have to ask her. Um, if you want me to make a video with my sister, let me know in the comments below. I'll show it to her. And uh, yeah, we can persuade her to, to come on again. Uh, Chaglad Didman asks, um, have you done something willy-nilly recently? Willy-nilly was a word that we looked at recently. So it means kind of without any order, kind of. So yeah, so the other day I did the washing and I took all the clothes. I just put them in my wardrobe willy-nilly. I just threw them in, didn't want to think about it too much. Just like, oh, sucks there, yeah. Just didn't hang things up, just pushed them in because I had to go out. So yeah, that was something that I did willy-nilly. Ooh, Volume on YouTube asks, um, what are the attitudes of British people who live in the UK when it comes to learning languages? Yeah, so you kind of sum it up here. I think a lot of us appreciate or really respect other people who can speak uh, numerous languages. Um, it, we really revere it. We think like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Um, I'm always blown away when I meet someone that can speak two languages, three languages. I'm like, wow, how do you do it? But yeah, I think you're right when you say that a lot of British people would think, yeah, I'd love to know another language, but I don't really need to. You know, like the reality is you can travel around the world and get by with English. That's a kind of demotivating factor for a lot of British people. Um, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's kind of the reality of it. Interesting facts asked, uh, do all British children go out away from their parents to earn and to live in their own life? Yeah, great question. So traditionally, um, you would leave home at 18 um, and either you would get a job um, and you'd find a place to live or you would go to university. Um, I think the reality of life these days is that it's really expensive to live either by yourself or to live in a shared house. And that a lot of young people can't afford it, right? Like it's, it's too expensive, especially in big cities like London, Manchester, places like that. So that age of leaving home has definitely got older um, as the years have gone by. But I know that in other cultures you stay and you live with your parents right up until you get married. That's not the case here. I think when you're in your 20s, a lot of British people want to live out. They want to be young and free and live their own lives. But the reality of how much it costs kind of means that they some of them can't. Ashley Beverly asks, what's your favorite British meal? 
My favorite British meal is a Sunday roast. I think it's super underrated. It's absolutely delicious. So on a Sunday, um, usually in winter, that's when I would have it, we have a Sunday roast, which is a big meal. Uh, you've got roasted meat, roast potatoes, Yorkshire pudding, amazing. Um, lots of vegetables, gravy, ah, oh, so good. That would be my favorite British meal. Carl Jans asks, which cities in the UK would you recommend to live uh, as a foreigner if London is too expensive? Okay, a bit like how I answered the university question, I would say that there are some really fantastic cities of a nice sort of small size, but with lots going on. So Bristol, I think is an amazing city, so much going on, so vibrant, great art scene there. Um, Brighton as well, by the sea, is also a really great place. And then you're just an hour from London, so you can kind of get up to London if you've got, you know, if there's a big event going on. Um, Manchester is very popular um, with students. So that could be a cool young place to be. Um, I think Edinburgh is a beautiful city, uh, but really cold in winter. So yeah, some great, yeah, so some ideas there for you. Abraham Cano asks, um, did you have or still have an old computer? Uh, what were your favorite video games? Uh, and did you ever, <coughs> did you ever meet Mr. Bean? I didn't meet Mr. Bean, no. I haven't spoken to the king yet. Favorite video game? Uh, Mario Kart. On the Super Nintendo, Mario Kart was my absolute favorite. Oh, and there was a football manager game called Championship Manager. I spent most of my teenage years playing that. Reese Crofton asks, what was the idea behind the channel and the course? The channel, the idea of the channel was that I just wanted to share fresh, modern British English with as many people as I could. I wanted to teach the language, the words, the phrases that I hear every day. Um, in London and around me. Italoco asks, what is your biggest dream? Ah, <sighs> Tottenham winning the Champions League. That's one of them. Um, <laughs> um, my personal dream? Wow, to live by the sea. I think to live by the sea. Every Londoner talks about living by the sea. Mary Honeywell asks, um, she's from Switzerland and she wants to know, um, is it easy to get a job with intermediate level in English? Um, I mean, depending on the job that you want, um, yeah, I think it's a great place to come and to get a job. And with, by getting a job, you're going to improve your English, particularly if you think about service industry. So um, I went to a pret manger the other day and, you know, all the people serving me are from different countries, right? You know, one's from France, one's from Turkey, one's from Morocco. And they are there practicing English just every day, all day, speaking to people. And I think that's an amazing way to improve your English. So, you know, at a basic level, I think it's a great place to come and improve your English. Timmy Stauffer asks, have you ever been to Derbyshire? Do you fancy a vlogging trip that way? I've never been to Derbyshire. Um, apart from the peaks, I think I've been to the Peak District, but I've never been to Derby or Derbyshire. I think, uh, yeah, I'd like to go. It sounds like a beautiful place, um, so for sure. Sachisadara asks, please could you recommend the best cafe in London? Obviously this is subjective, but I would say that the Pavilion Cafe in Victoria Park is my favorite. They do amazing buns and they have a beautiful view of the lake. Go check it out. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate your support. I appreciate your energy. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I can't wait to keep serving you, to keep helping you learn English this year. And thank you again to all of you that have asked me questions. This is Teacher Tom in London saying goodbye.